right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Passive Cash Flow Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron Fragnito, and we have an exciting guest today that has really been very successful in building a business from the ground up, a successful entrepreneur I want to have on the podcast today, running a business that has nothing to do with real estate, kind of a breath of fresh air here. So we're going to focus on entrepreneurship, running a business, uh, all the headaches and the, the good, the bad, the ugly of being an entrepreneur. Hopefully we'll open it up today in our, our Passive Cash Flow podcast. And our guest today is Mohan Morali. Mohan, how are we doing today? I'm doing very well. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Nice to meet you. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, I really enjoyed meeting you the other uh, day at the Entrepreneurship Club. So I, I met Mohan here at a very exclusive group, really, really cool group. If you if you can check it out, it's for entrepreneurs, the uh, E&O Club. We'll talk a little bit of that briefly. It's a really cool group, very invite only, but um, really exciting place and, and a great place to meet you as well. I was inspired by your story and by your success as well as an entrepreneur. And, um, you know, what I what I like about these entrepreneurship groups is also we're not afraid to talk about the challenges, right? We're not just trying to sell each other a, a service or a good. We're really talking about our challenges there and how we developed a company. But I really enjoyed your story. And uh, can you tell the viewers here a little about yourself and, and how you got started in, in business? Wonderful. Yeah, actually, I got an opportunity, a phone call as the proverbial phone call that they talk about uh, on 16th of September 2001 from the organization called SWIFT, which is the Worldwide Financial Transfers Network. Uh, they said, hey, we understand you know something about SWIFT and uh, we would like you to come and set up what we call as the SWIFT Service Bureau. So I said, okay, and we started getting tracking on that. There were banks that had lost their connections to the SWIFT network because of the collapse that they were all situated on the two uh, World Trade Centers. So they needed a house, a means for connecting their uh, financial networks back. And they realized that in the Northern America, whether it's Mexico or USA or Canada, there was no SWIFT service bureau that could seamlessly take these banks' connections and plug them in and keep their financial traffic flowing. So that is where the need for building a soft service bureau came up. And we said, okay, we'll build it. You know, with the knowledge of the people who came to support me, the people who were already working with me in my previous organization, we decided to go ahead and build this. And that is how Accenture was formed uh, mm -hmm. a year later. We started the job on 16th of, Jan uh, June, 16th of September, 2001. But in June of 2002, we actually had formally uh, established this company. So we are about 22 years now in running this June. At People's Capital Group, we help you invest in real estate. Build your wealth by owning professionally managed apartment buildings in the Northern New Jersey market. We wanna show you how owning real estate is attainable, even for the busy professionals that don't have the time or experience investing in real estate. Now we only work with select people who are serious about building wealth. So find out if you qualify at peoplescapitalgroup.com. Wow, 22 years of running your company there. That's that's really incredible. Uh, I know I read these statistics all the time that something like nine out of 10 businesses fail in the first five years. And then the next five years, like, Nine out of 10 of those businesses fail. You know, my, <laughs> my business partner and I were like, whoa, we're at year 10. So I guess we're the top 5%, you know, we're doing something yeah. right. So yeah, um, that's true. one of the EO things is the top 1% that survived 20 years. Wow. Top 1% of uh, uh, a new businesses that start up survive 20 years, which is wow. a very, very small number. Yes. Yes, it is. Absolutely. So what, what gave you the idea to start a business like this? Uh, I realized that there was a need in the market, there was opportunity, and I had the right set of uh, people surrounding me at the time who knew the technology, who knew the uh, the industry, and who came from SWIFT. So with the combination of the right people in the right place and mm -hmm. the right opportunity, we just said, let's go for it. The mm -hmm. challenge was to find investors who would believe because we were talking of 2001, 2002, and that was a market in recession, just like this market that people are expecting. So the cash was hard to find. Investors were hard to find. And here we were with the concept that was like a dot-com concept, you know, the 98 dot-com. So people had, the dot-com booms were fresh in everybody's mind. Mm -hmm. So it was a challenge to find investors who could believe that large organizations would be willing to 
send their mission critical um, financial transactions through a third party company and not themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it was a mindset, it was a paradigm shift in thinking, but we were lucky. We were bootstrapped because uh, investors did not believe this concept. So we bootstrapped ourselves through whatever we could. And as the customers, as the clients started coming on board, we kept pushing, pouring back the profits back into the business. Mm -hmm. So our model has grown like that over the last 22 years. And today we are lucky that we do not have an external investor and we are completely independent organization. Wow. So you never took on an angel investor or an equity investor. Incredible. Incredible. Mm -hmm. And imagine they did come in the first year of your mm -hmm. company, you know, and made like a quarter million dollar investment or something. Imagine like how much of your business they'd own today and what that would be worth, you know, and uh, boy, yeah. that's yeah, right. So that it's crazy when you think that. I remember mm -hmm. years ago, I had an investor looking to buy People's Capital Group. Um, and, uh, you know, we were kind of getting started. We were about four years in at the time, um, had a good amount of momentum, but definitely didn't have what we have today. Uh, now, you know, six years later or so, um, and boy, if I had sold for the price I was giving it away for at the time, you know, um, I would have regretted it. I really would have, and I'd be working for someone else. I still would have owned part of the company. It was a partial buyout, but, um, I wouldn't really be my own boss at the end of the day. You know, I'd be working with it. Sure much stricter partnership. And now with Seth and I, we own the company 50-50. So we're able to run the business as we see fit and um, you know, done a pretty good job. But yeah, I mean, that that's always a challenge of an entrepreneur. You think, oh, you know, I could go with this investor, not really have to worry about money anymore, you know, have some flush accounts, be able to do the type of growth I'm trying to do, maybe get there faster or easier. Um, but then in the big picture, you know, it seems so nice at the moment. It's like, thank God I have this investor. Thank God I have this option. But then, you know, as it, as it didn't pan out or it didn't work mm -hmm. out and the, the fine print kind of got in the way of everything, I'm really glad it did. Because if I had sold back then and given up equity in our company when we were getting started, it would have been a very, you know, short-sighted strategy. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's that's impressive. But good, wow, so you, yeah, go ahead. The good thing for me was that sorry, didn't mean to interrupt you. Nobody believed in it, so nobody was very really eager to come and take a part of it, which is good. Uh, yeah, tech tech companies are kind of a hard sell, especially after the dot com bubble, right? So you were like in the middle of the dot com bubble, right? I just started two thousand was dot com. This was two thousand one nine eleven. Right. So you couldn't have asked for a better brew of things to have uh, a cup of tea. <laughs> well, listen, if you didn't have the dot-com bubble, you probably would have got a bunch of capital. You'd own like a fraction of your company and who knows where you'd be. Then you have to service those investors, right? So who knows where you'd be, right? So I think we're in a good spot today. Oh, absolutely. 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 That's interesting. So, okay. So now, um, so you work with a number of different companies to help them uh, run, run the payments or what, what exactly does your company do to understand your service there? To put it very simply, we are like the UPS. Mm -hmm. for the financial messaging. Mm -hmm. We take the financial messages that are created from the internal systems, be it a payroll file, be it a procurement file, be it any other payment file, ACH file, it doesn't matter. As long as it's a financial instruction, trade finance, securities trading, you know, uh, commodities trading, whatever be the financial messaging content of it, we take it from point A to point B across mm -hmm. different systems, across different networks, and deliver it in the way it is supposed to be delivered to the recipient and provide complete visibility to it. So today, for example, our clients move about $50 billion on a daily basis through our networks. And we have about uh, half a million dollars, half a million transactions, or I would say half a million files moving maybe millions of transactions through them on a daily wow. basis. Wow. We... So we are just, just a UPS for financial messaging. Half a million transactions a day. That's... Yeah. yeah. Wow. It's more than half a million transactions more... a day. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. So, uh, and so you, you, it's a volume based business. So you get like a yeah. fraction of a cent for each trend, something like that, or no? I wish. <laughs> I really wish we did that because if I'm doing that a fraction of a cent for $50 billion, then that we'd be in a different sphere all over. <laughs> <I'll be listed laughs> you wouldn't be on the Passive Cash Flow podcast. You'd be on an island somewhere <laughs> with your feet up, right? <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. But no, we don't take a cut on the transaction volume, but we take a cut on the, we our pricing is basically based on number of boxes that are moving, the mm -hmm. size of the box, the weight of the box, and things like that, but not what's inside. You may send an iPhone inside it. We don't take a piece of the iPhone or we don't right. take anything. You can send right. a gold bar for all we care. We yeah. don't care. 
it's it's funny when we first met i was comparing my business to yours and kind of, we were laughing about man if i wanted to go from you know uh, from 150 units to you know 1500 units i'd have to do a lot of things in between you know expand our management services uh bring on hundreds mm -hmm. of more investors you know team mm -hmm. up with family offs different things find great deals right so there's so many moving pieces and over time yes we could accomplish that maybe over the next 5 or 10 15 years and develop, you know, 2000 units or so in our portfolio. But mm -hmm. the, the bottom line also is it, it building in real estate is kind of brick by brick in a sense, you know, I mean, there's yes. different ways to accelerate it, you know, with real estate syndication, you can obviously accelerate what you're buying and help more and more people invest and the sky's kind of the limit. But, you know, it's, it's really about building out the processes and things like that. Um, and building out your investor base and your reputation. Mm -hmm. With a tech company, once you have that platform in place, right, once you have mm -hmm. that system, if you set it up properly to handle that amount of traffic, essentially, I, I know the grass still is green on the other side, you, you like click a button and it goes, right? You just count the money coming in your bank account. Is that how a tech company works? <laughs> yeah, the scalability factors vary uh, compared to a brick and mortar. Yes, you can, you can for a very small incremental uh, change in resources, for example, you can process a significantly larger volume of traffic in our systems. Mm -hmm. And also the way our systems are structured, the way our processes are structured, we don't need a huge army mm -hmm. to manage these volumes. Right. As we add more clients, there's enough uh, scalability or enough resiliency or uh, elasticity within our teams to handle those additional uh, businesses. Mm -hmm. And then uh, as, as our client base increases, we keep ramping up the teams. Right. So as of today, we are literally hiring almost six people in the last five days. So six it's been a, wow. In the last five days. So there is a need for people in the company as the business is growing. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it is not directly proportionate to the growth in the traffic volumes. Right. We can have a significant traffic volume growth with very, very minimal people growth. Wow. And so how many employees roughly do you have in total now? I think we are about 60 as on date. Okay. Around the world. Wow. Oh, around the world. All right. So yes. a lot of your employees are able to work from home or you have different offices around the world? We are a hybrid company. We right. have a few offices, four offices around the world, and everybody else is working from their homes. Okay. All right. Very good. Very good. Where's your US, US office located here? Uh, we are here headquartered in uh, East Brunswick, New Jersey. Sure. Sure. Yeah, we're not too far from you. We're over here in Somerville, New Jersey. Yes, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, good. Yeah, I've done some real estate deals in East Brunswick. It's good market, actually. Good. The Brunswick's mm -hmm. in general, good market to own real estate in. So it is um, going well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Sounds like it's going well. So that's really interesting. So let's break into kind of more the entrepreneurial side of the conversation and just, mm -hmm. you know, try to put yourself in people's shoes, kind of, you know, getting started. It's a very daunting word, entrepreneurship. It, it, it's got its attractiveness, right? It, uh, the, the media makes it sound like it's all fun and games. You see entrepreneurs driving around in Ferraris and private jets and, you know, living in big houses. But there's a, a reality behind entrepreneurship that it's not as glorious as sometimes people selling you a book or CD about entrepreneurship make it seem. And uh, what are some things you really learned getting started? Um, just maybe some, you know, good tips of the trade, getting started, building a business or even building your business to the next level now. Um, some kind of like concrete rules you type to try to follow in in, in building your business. So what do you think those might be? Mm -hmm. And that's a tough question. There are lots of lots of lessons I learned mm -hmm. uh, building this. Mm -hmm. The one single thing is that you have to have a single-minded focus on what you want to do. Mm -hmm. Because as we are building, as we are growing through, as the challenges come in, you are forced, your mind is forced to like, okay, let's take this op opportunity. Maybe this will be better. Maybe that will be better. And you know, these are these you know, side roads that can come as you're going on your uh, main road. You mm -hmm. have to say, no, I don't want to take the side roads. I need to go keep going on the side road. And another thing is you need to, at least that's what I need. Uh, I learned is that I didn't want to have an option saying, I, you know what, if this business fails, I'll go and take a job. Mm -hmm. Then you have a safety net called a job so you're not giving 100% to the business. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so coming from a employed, you know, salaried uh, uh, position for almost 20 years and then coming into this to start this, mm -hmm. I, I had to say that, no, I don't have a choice of going and working. I need to make this a success. 
So yeah. there's no choice. So that kind of a single-minded focus. And it took us about two years from the day we started before we landed our first client. So to be wow. perseverant through the whole two years and look at every opportunity and say, okay, next opportunity, next opportunity. Every no was the next opportunity for me. So wow. we went through about 365 potential conversations before we landed our first client. Wow. That's a hard sell to... Uh... <laughs> Wow. But you found the motivation to keep going. I mean, that must have been a hard time because you still have bills to pay, you know, when you're running a business. I know you were getting started then, so you had less employees, maybe a l- little less overhead, less offices, but I'm sure you still had a monthly nut of a few thousand dollars you had to come up with or so, you know, and that's a scary thing when you're investing, yes. you know, your hard earned capital um, and not taking on outside investors. So you were really using your own, your own cash to get this business off the ground. It's a plastic card. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do I know that? <laughs> Got a few of those. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Same here. You know, credit is uh, the lifeblood of a, a startup company. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. You know, and, uh, I remember I went out and got business credit when we got started. There was I, I signed up for some of these business cre- credit guru guys, and and they're pretty helpful. Um, in fact, I'll, I'll name drop here. I signed up with Joe Lawrence, good guy, good businessman. Definitely knows his credit very well. If you're looking for business credit, check him out, Joe Lawrence. So okay. that was a guy I signed up with. Boy, probably uh, 12 years ago or something. You know, at this point, 11 years ago, and. Um, got like a, a $50,000 credit card, you know, a few different credit cards, was able to mm-hmm. do some marketing, put our marketing dollars on that, get some deals coming in the door, start moving some real estate on the investment side. And um, so, yeah, that allowed us to get started and get our first marketing materials out there and get our first deals done. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, it's incredible, incredible tool. But boy, make sure you pay that credit card back on time. You're in trouble, right? Yep, we did that. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So yeah, stay focused, right? I mean, that yes. is such an important, that is one of, yeah, mm-hmm. that is so important because I feel like these days we're so distracted, you know, with social media and different platforms and so much different things. I mean, even this podcast, for example, I have a new piece of content every single week, you know, new guests, new topics. Um, it's really incredible how much content I just make here at People's Capital Group, the Passive Cash Flow podcast, and how many people listen to it and download it and enjoy it. It actually kind of blows my mind, um, mm-hmm. and it's really quite a, a reward. Um, but in, you know, so staying focused and not getting off track, and I'm so guilty of this as well. You know, shiny object syndrome. You know, because that's, that's what we do as entrepreneurs. We want to go build yes. the next. Facebook, you know, the next Google, whatever it is, right? Oh, this idea, this new mousetrap, this better mousetrap, right? So, but staying focused, keeping that vision aligned, but also what I found is trying to um, adapt your vision a little bit with the changing of the markets and technology and and, and things like that. Um, Have you noticed that you've had to make pivots in your business in time? Or have you been able to kind of drive forward this singular model here? Oh, yes. We, being nimble and being able to pivot in the right direction is very important. There's a lesson I learned called you shoot bullets first, find the target and then shoot the cannon. You know, you don't throw cannonballs out there until you find the target. So this is Jim Collins' uh, favorite uh, thing. It's not mine. And what we, as we have seen different challenges. We saw the 2008 challenge crisis hit the markets. We saw in 2010, one of our biggest uh, network providers started competing with us. So wow. the people we are feeding started competing with us. So that was a big challenge. Yeah. Uh, but we had already, as part of our SWOT analysis in 2002, had uh, drawn these scenarios. What if scenarios of this thing happens? This happens. So we took about 15 or 20 scenarios. And one of the scenarios, what if the company that's feeding you is also going to compete with you? Mm-hmm. So we said, oh, that doesn't look like it's possible, but you know what? Let's put it on the desk and let's put a scenario and let's uh, do a tabletop exercise and see what we need to do. So we all of those things helped us. We pivoted in 2008, we pivoted in 2010, and again, we kept pivoting. Even now, we are just two years ago, we pivoted uh, uh, as late as 2022. January, we said, you know what? We are known in the industry for what we are doing, which is building the financial connectivity. Mm-hmm. Okay, there are bigger players against it, but we still need to pivot and build something bigger and better for our clients to see value in it. So we came out with this platform that solves one of the biggest uh, challenges in the industry, which is having fraud controls and access controls across multiple uh, systems. You know, everybody has a portal, everybody has an application to log into, and you have hundreds of users log into different applications. And it's a nightmare out there. 
So that, that was also a pivot. So we had to constantly keep seeing, okay, how the industry is moving, what's happening out there, and how do we keep ourselves nimble enough to take the benefit of those challenges and as new threats come in, be able to build a moat around ourselves. So mm -hmm. that's what we're doing. So it's always a concept. You you have to be ahead of the fastest. Uh, if two people are running and the tiger is chasing, you have to be faster than the fast the other gentleman, right? Yeah. So that's how we have to be in our business. We have to be faster than our competitors. Just faster than better, right? Absolutely. That's a good good lesson for when you're out running a line or a bear, definitely. Just faster mm -hmm. than the other guy. Okay, interesting. And um, now, do you find it hard? You said you're hiring uh, f five people in six days or six people in five days. Regardless, you're hiring a lot of people quickly. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, do you find it challenging to find good talent in today's labor market? Uh, it is getting a little better. Oh, sorry about this. It's getting a little better. We are uh, seeing that um, up until about a month ago, it was challenging. But in the last uh, 30 days, uh, we are seeing even good uh, resources coming to us from different companies because there are a lot of people who are very nice, who are very capable. But unfortunately, the big companies don't need them. Mm -hmm. The reason is their their share values are falling. They need to show better uh, profits per employee and things like that. And you know they don't care if you take 12,000 people from Google and another 20% are going to go out in the next few weeks as per what we hear in the news. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a lot of people out there who are going to be out who are good, very capable, and for no fault of theirs, have been let go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the markets are changing. And we have been, our goal is to basically ensure the right positions are filled to the right people mm -hmm. so they can drive the company in the right direction. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's good. So I guess the double-edged swords, yeah, we are seeing tech companies struggle now. We are seeing them uh, with the layoffs happening um, now. Those are some of the high sought after employees, though. So that's the good news. I read some type of article that most uh, tech employees found employment within like four weeks of, of leaving their prior position, which is essentially means they went, you know, and applied for a few jobs and got like one of the first, you know, 10 or 12 jobs they applied for. So yes. it doesn't seem like it's it's too hard for, you know, experienced uh, tech uh, employees and, to get positions. And yeah. qualified people, they should be qualified. But we, when we hire or when we interview candidates, we look for cultural fit first. Right. Right. They may be the best in their what they do, but if they're not a cultural fit for our culture, we don't um, even consider them. Mm -hmm. And what is your company culture there? It's so important to have a good company culture. How would you define your, your company culture? It's a very tough question. I <laughs> wish I could answer it in a very easy way that people can understand. Right. Our culture is purely dependent on team growth. Okay. We want people to build teams, build leaders, mm -hmm. and be a team player all around. And yeah. I'm and understand the entrepreneurial spirit with which this company has been built. We don't want people working in uh, very large organizations with a high business class men, uh, flying mentality to come and work in an entrepreneurial and find that, hey, this is not their cup of tea. Mm -hmm. So we are very looking for people who understand uh, to stay nimble and to stay profitable. We need to have, always have the uh, Amazon, best Jeff Bezos day one mentality, mm -hmm. which every day of your business is day one of your business. Interesting. It, expand on that a little bit. I haven't heard that 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 mentality. What, what is that? What does that mean exactly? Mm, I'm not the right person to explain <laughs> that. But, <it's, laughs> that but funny? basically, we... you have to believe that every day is, could be your last day in the business. Right, right. You have a competitor on your heels willing to catch up. So you have to be very nimble. You have to always be flexible to keep moving. Mm -hmm. And uh, you cannot afford to just stay complacent in where you're on your... On your achievements or laurels you've got to keep saying okay this is good but i need to do something better yeah as they say comfort is a killer right yes and uh, you you do see that with big companies they kind of get in their own way uh you know and they uh, often have trouble pivoting with new new you know uh markets and new demand and, and whatnot and that's why small companies come and disrupt the industry and sometimes mm -hmm. the big guys are chasing behind. Now they have the means to often buy those small companies out, which uh, ultimately, you know, could be a perhaps a good option down the road for you know a company like yours. So that's interesting. And um, okay, yeah, I, I like that attitude. I like that mentality. Obviously, worked for Jeff Bezos there, developed a very strong company. So mm -hmm. um, I think they're finally profitable, right? Amazon. It, it took uh, took a few years, but they're finally finally probably making. Mm -hmm. Make us some big money there. That's good. That's good. Um, all right. Excellent. Now, as far as uh, just, you know, overall um, 
exiting a business too, you know, right? So people think, oh my gosh, you know, what what's the retirement strategy? Do you feel like your your company is something that ultimately could be handed down to your your heirs at some point, or is it something that perhaps down the road there'll be an exit for yourself? You know, selling it to a larger tech company or something like that, you know? Or, or obviously, you... the heirs are not the kind of people who would possibly my kids have their own dreams. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to saddle them with what we do. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, we've given them a good opportunity to do what they like to do. Mm-hmm. As far as uh, we are concerned, I think we are always looking for uh, partners to come on board. But, you know, it's not easy to have another person in your bedroom. Because mm-hmm. once, as you rightly said, started at the beginning of the conversation, bringing an investor means a lot. So we need to, we are talking to a lot of people. But who is the right partner depends on how they see our vision, how they align with it and see the the independence of what we have built and uh, take that forward rather than killing what we have built and try to rebuild it elsewhere. Yeah. So there are a lot of things that we're looking for in a partner, including their ability to grow our company bigger, being able to expand into different markets where, where we are very highly US and South America focused. We want to expand to the Asian markets, into the European markets. So we're looking at partners who can bring us that kind of a reach, their mm-hmm. networks, and of course, the capital. Yeah, for absolutely. absolutely. Okay. And as far as your vision, you know, your five-year vision for your company, uh, roughly, uh, you know, wrapping up here, what would you say your, your vision is over the next five years for your company? Uh, we want to be listed as one of the best company among the best companies to work for. Mm-hmm. You know, there is, uh, you know, the Fortune, the Inc. Magazine, the Newsweek, all of them have their own ratings of the best companies to work for. Mm-hmm. And we want to be listed in each one of them as consistently as one of the best companies to work for. That's awesome. Which means our people are happy, our clients are happy, and we as stakeholders or shareholders are happy. Right, right. Very, very, very good goal. Very good goal. Now, are you looking to connect with uh, anyone as far as, you know, I know you're hiring. Uh, is there like a website you want to put out there or anything like that? Or do you want to connect with people uh, in any way? Absolutely. We, we are looking, the New Jersey market is very strong in the healthcare sector. Mm-hmm. And I would love to, you know, get our inroads into that market because all our clients are in different sectors. Like healthcare, we don't have except for one company in Long Island. So we're trying to see how we can get introductions at the treasurer levels and things like that, you know, or that kind of titles to see what we can do. You know, there are a lot of uh, banks in New York who have been talking to us, so reaching out to the operations, the CEOs of these banks is something that we are really looking to do. Interesting. And if someone has connections to that space, uh, how could they contact you? Website or an email or something uh, like that? The best way is to, yes, website. All the emails are there. All our profiles are there. And my email is my first name dot last name at axeltrees.com. Mm-hmm. So it's very easy to uh, get contact with me. Sure. And my and- emails are in Google. People, a lot of salespeople do reach out to me and keep sending me a lot of emails that I don't need to read. So obviously, <laughs> my information is out there in the public domain. <laughs> sure. But website course. is the best. Website is the best way to reach us. Okay. And what's your website? Axeltrees.com. A X L E T R E E S dot com. Okay. Axeltrees.com. Okay. Excellent. We'll put that in the show notes. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Mohan, for coming on. I really enjoyed what we were talking about here today. And, uh, you know, you really inspired me when we were talking uh, the other week as well. And, um, you know, I, I, it's really incredible what you've done here with this company. Um, and I, I really, I think your goal there being one of the best places to work for uh, and getting those uh, awards in the future, I, I can see that happening. You know, you have the passion for that. You care about your employees and you care about your business. Um, it's not just a number on a screen or a paycheck, you know, so I, I see that in you. And uh, that's one of the reasons I like to join these entrepreneurship groups and whatnot, because those are the types of people uh, mm-hmm. you meet. And uh, mm-hmm. now I, I know the uh, the E&O group is kind of invite only, but if you are an entrepreneur and you are looking to meet like-minded fellows, I know there's restrictions. Your business has to be a certain size, like a million in gross revenue annually. So not too crazy, but um that that's a good group now how long have you uh been a member of the the eno organization there the eo organization or entrepreneurs organization i part of the new jersey chapter mm-hmm. i joined them in 2021 march so this year i'll finish two years with them okay great 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 yeah and that's been a good place to meet other people so yeah to our listeners mm-hmm. check that out as well that yeah i think if you just google uh entrepreneur what is EO. it eo.org 
Yeah, EO.org. EO Network, EO Network.org. Yes. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's a great entrepreneurship group. There's all local chapters, I believe, all throughout the country. So um, mm-hmm. if you're not local to New Jersey, there may be a local chapter there. So if you own your own business, check out eno.org as well. And that's where I met Mohan and, and many other great, uh, very savvy business people of all different industries and, and uh, mm-hmm. experience levels. You know, it was really cool. There's kind of people there getting started. And then there's experienced people that have sold their business and exited. And you know, um, so really the whole the whole spectrum there, very exciting and um, excellent. Thank, excellent. You for, yeah. thank you for having me. I really appreciate you giving me an opportunity to on your platform. It's really appreciated. Thank you, Mohan. Absolutely. I enjoyed you joining us here. And of course, to our listeners, you can enjoy Mohan's website there and team up with him in different ways. And if you want to learn more about the real estate into what we do here at People's Capital Group, of course, our website's peoplescapitalgroup.com. And we help people invest in real estate and apartment buildings here in New Jersey. We've been doing this about 10 years and have a good infrastructure in place to make sure that our investors are consistently profiting from the real estate investments here in high demand markets in North Jersey. So check us out at peoplescapitalgroup.com. And of course, we have a new episode on the Passive Cash Flow podcast. Every single Friday, we release a new episode. And uh, we also do webinars, weekly webinars as well. So if you haven't followed us, start following us. It all starts at peoplescapitalgroup.com. Make sure you hit the subscribe button as well if you're watching us on YouTube and uh, or another podcast platform there. Make sure you subscribe to our show and possibly put a, a comment in the comments there. We'd love to hear about what you're looking to learn about, other guests you suggest for our show as well. And hey, if you want to be a guest on the Passive Cash Flow podcast, you can always go to peoplescapitalgroup.com and get in touch with us. If we feel like you're a fit for the show, we'll bring you on as well. So thanks a lot, Mohan, for coming on this afternoon. And good work there building this business. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Bye.